So hey everybody, uh, my name is Dr. Getz. I work with Chef and Senior Consulting Room here. Um, this is actually a talk that I just recently gave here in Kansas City uh, at Midwest I.O. Um, which is awesome. If you didn't go, you should probably go next year. Um, but anyways, uh, so who am I? Credit of Senior Consulting Room here with Chef. Uh, messing around with planning, managing, and operating uh, what we call an Ryan application, right? Like, for eight plus years. I've done lease management, I've done operations, I've done architecture, right? Um, I'm also not a woodworker, right? So I'm kind of a major at heart, right? Like I like to make things and I like to make things do awesome things. So um, so this talk is not about joining a cult, right? And so this is really important. The title of this talk, I'll even go back to slides, is images, containers, and config management. This isn't a talk about doc. It, it is kind of talk about that. But <laughs> only tangentially, right? Like, this talk is not about joining a cult, right? How many times does new technology come around and they're like, that's it, everything you knew before today, it's gone, right? <laughs> it's the coolest thing. Like, you don't have to do anything else ever again. You just use, you just use this new tool and all your problems are solved. And unfortunately, and you know, over my experiences, there's generally lots of opinions on the only right way to do things. The problem is when somebody comes to you and says, this is the only right way to do this, you should run away screaming and like not listen to them. Because there's never only one right way to do it. There's a good way or a recommended way. There's always more than one way to solve the problems, right? Um, and in reality, when it comes down to managing systems, the truth is you always have a combination. Right? You have a toolbox. You don't just have a hammer. You have a collection of tools that make things go. And this has existed forever, right? This is the dawn of managing systems. It's never just been we only have one thing. Well, I guess maybe like when the first computer arose and there was only one thing, right? Like, but then somebody made a program and then there was two things, right? So, um, so ultimately, right? Like, this talk is not about being a cult. It's about how to use new technologies and integrate them and manage your system in a way that actually is sensible and safe. So if you think about managing systems at a kind of like a high level, um, there's only a few options that really exist, right? You can have artisanal machines made of sweat, right? Um, you can have these pristine virtual machines that you spin up. Um, you can have isolated containers, which is all the new hotness, even though it's like with the old hotness with like free DSD jails and solar zones and like containers are your thing, but factors kind of new. Um, uh, there's also just in time automatic configuration management. What I mean by that is tools like Ansible, Salt, Chef, Puppet, um, you name it, right? Juju, I guess, if you call it, right? Like, um, and then maybe all or some of the above. That's really the purpose of this talk, right? It's generally which you want to aim for is all or some of the above. So let's talk about these individually. Our chisel machines made of metal and sweat. Do we really need to talk about why this is not sustainable? Right? Like, and, and that's cool, if you have one server you need to manage, and you want to hand manage it, that's awesome, right? But I would still argue that there's probably a better way than manually configuring everything every single time other than Does anybody still do this today? Yeah? Many of them. <laughs> Many of them? Not <laughs> all of them though, right? Like, uh, just some of them? I Many sounds right. <laughs> sound sound. <laughs> Many sounds sound, right? I, 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 yeah. But basically, the story is, if you want to be an artisan, go like pick up work working or metal working or whatever. Technology is not the place, right? Like artisanal machines, we are fast outpacing the ability to hand manage it. Right? Um, even the most simple WordPress systems, right? As they grow in demand, right? so that's, aside from my personal blog, which I still run on a team on micro, but that's cool. Um, <laughs> you know, like, like you start scaling out, and it becomes a hard thing to manage. So we go to the next step, which is kind of like virtual machines, right? So you have these two paradigms that's kind of hot on the topic of, on the tip of everybody's tongue right now, which is, you know, do I use a container, right? I have all these virtual machines. I never heard about this container before. They must be new. And they're not really new, but like maybe I can just do and use these things. So let's talk about this for a little bit. I'm not talking about Docker, we're not talking about AWS. We're literally talking about the concepts of a virtual machine versus a container. So the containers are an application and its dependencies running in isolation in user land outside of the kernel. So what does that mean? 
you share the underlying kernel OS, right? Also notice that I say kernel here, which also means that like this host OS, although it's purple and generalized, means not Windows, right? Like that's what that means, right? Not Windows. So you've got this thing over here, right? It's a container. You've got like before the Docker engine was slotted on here, you have this, you know, your bins and libs and everything was shared, you had the host OS kernel down here. Then you can have these like basically a user landscape, these applications that run isolated, right? Sounds awesome. Um, virtual machines have tons of overhead. You've got your bare metal down here, you've got your host OS, you have this horrible hypervisor in here, and it's like, hey, let's go ahead and spin up another OS on top of the OS I already have. So here's some more overhead, right? And so the capacity to spin up multiple apps is significantly reduced, right? You're using a bunch of resources. Um, so this is why containers is pretty appealing to a lot of people, especially anybody who's running their application on uh, cloud infrastructure like Amazon. Who's doing that today, right? How big are your mills, right? Like, how much do you wish you could actually max out the resource utilization of those instances, right? So, this is a lot of the appeal for people running containers. This is why Google's new Kubernetes stuff and the, and the, the partnership with Docker is really taking off, is because people want to just take this like, tiny little slice and not have to pay for a massive overhead of a whole VM, right? So, now we've kind of talked about those two things. Awesome, sweet. We go back to golden images, right? Like, who remembers the days, or who still is living those days? Golden images, right? Like, a big thing, and it's never going to change, right? Immutable infrastructure doesn't exist, okay? So, like, I'm telling you straight up, like, the golden image problem will never go away. The moment you think you're going to have a snapshot of a thing that will never change, and you're just going to drop it in, like, a Lego block, the configuration drift is a real thing. It's always going to happen, unless you're killing your containers or your VMs within hours of creating. Right? If you're doing that, it's awesome. Cool. But I think a lot of people aren't there. Right? So the problem with you know the, the whole container idea is so if I have these containers, right? Like I can go back to home images, but that whole dozen server images turns into dozens of container images you now have to manage. You have to add another layer onto your Docker when onto your Docker container you need to make a change, right? There's a, bit, there's a really good slide that we give in the fundamentals of the chef class, which is essentially why golden images are such a challenge for people. And if, if you have 15 different servers and all you need to make is one syslog configuration change, one line in your chain, in, in your, and all of your servers, you now have to make 15 different golden images. And that takes time, right? It's a lot of time that you don't have. Right? So this is where the just-in-time configuration comes in and solves that problem. And the same thing actually happens in containers. Right? So if I build a container that runs Nginx, and I have a configuration for that Nginx container, and I need to make a configuration change, I need to add another layer to my container, or I need to build a new image and spin up a new container. Right? So <clears throat> this AOS layer, how many people know what this is? Nobody? All right, how many people know about Docker? How many people use Docker? How many people use Docker in production? Really? And for government. Huh? And for government. Whoa. I totally want to talk to you. <laughs> That's like, wow. Okay, cool. So don't heckle me, please. So, um, so the AWS layering, right? If anybody doesn't understand what this means, the, the money that Docker brought was you have containers, right? And that's cool. But the AWS layering is this thing that they add to it, which essentially makes like a Git commit history for your file system on your container, right? So you can make a change, it makes a hash, you can totally roll back, right? Go back to the, the configuration on the file system that you had before. And it mitigates a lot of this, right? But it has some limits. I think it used to be 47 and it's, or 42 layers, and now it's at 127 layers. At a certain point, you can't add any more layers on your container and you have to start over. So, um, so essentially, right, we're just kicking the entire the, the, you know, the can down the road without managing any convergence of state. So, convergence, what does that actually mean? How many of you actually know what convergence is, other than I just showed you? <laughs> <laughs> right? So, how many people have ever heard of Mark Burgess? How many people ever use CF Engine? So, Mark Burgess is the reason why CF Engine exists. He's also the reason why configuration management exists as a product. Right? Dude is a scientist, he invented this. Right? Like, so, it, <clears throat> his whole definition, this quote, I really like. 
right? Because it sums it up pretty neatly. And these are two, two terms that you'll hear a lot when you talk about configuration um, and managing configurations for machines. So convergence is essentially like fixing the outcome and compute of the route, right? I put in a destination in my GPS finder, and it tells me how to get, get, get there, and then I follow that route, and I get there to a point. Whereas congruence is about repeating that recipe in a sequence of known steps to massage the system into, into shape, right? It's the idea of, I have this list of steps, and I'm gonna go down, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven, fail, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight, fail, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, nine, fail, and over and over, right? So, to sum that up, convergence is coming to a desired end state, and congruence is building a result from a blank state, right? Over and over until you get there. Um, but there's two different approaches, right? And this congruence model can actually end up being a time sink, right? If you always start from a just a blank, bare bones OS and auto config everything up, right? Like you have Chef or Puppet or Ansible or whatever, and you just pop in a blank CentOS ISO, right? Or a box or a VM, and then you go like, hey, all right, let's set up MTP and like let's do all this other stuff that like you know, that do once and never do again, right? It can be time consuming when you bring up new VMs. This is another appeal of containers, right? They come up instantaneously. Right? There's no configuration to happen, they're just there, right? Um, <clears throat> another problem with building from scratch is that specification of application versions becomes extremely important. Um, if you aren't very specific in your application versioning, you could end up with an unintended deployment. If your automated configuration that builds from scratch every single time, you build server A and it and puts out version 1.0 of your application, you now build server B, you've updated your configuration code, and it's deployed 1.1 version of your application. But you didn't go back and run your configuration management for all the other ones, so now you've got two different versions of your application. Right? So it becomes really important to make sure that you understand the versions that you're releasing, you kind of have to maintain that, make sure that you're constantly updating your configuration management. And then these changes, right, can happen unexpectedly if you don't plan ahead. Right? If you don't actually think about the item potence of the configuration management tool that you have, you could absolutely push out changes that you weren't ready to push out. Or even worse, you're working with a distributed group of like a lot of people, and they make a change, and you make a push of configuration out, and something happens, and they weren't ready, and you weren't ready, and everything goes down. Right? So that happens a lot. So this is kind of some of the, the flaws with automated configuration management, right? If you don't do a lot of planning, right? These are some things that can come up and bite you. So what if I told you, you can actually use these three things together, right? We have, I like, basically outlined pros and cons for every single one of these things. So which one are you supposed to use? And I think the answer here is to use all of them, right? You leverage the power of each of these tools to counteract the, com the negatives of the tools, right? So what do I mean by that? So let's talk about a real world application. So if you look at pretty much every application architecture on the face of the planet, with the exception of some like really highly architected service oriented architectures, they generally end up like this. You have an OS layer that needs to operate, that's managed the operating system. You have, then it very rarely changes, right? You spin up an OS, and change that often, maybe that security patch. Um, you may have a few supporting applications that set change semi-frequently, things like uh, I have a Rails app that runs on Nginx, so I need to run Nginx, but my app is what's actually changing, right? That's this little application code that's changing pretty rapidly. My Nginx configuration shouldn't be changing very often, although sometimes it does, right? So, and this actually translates pretty well into a model that looks kind of like this. You've got a VM image that acts as a base, right? a big solid foundation that has an operating system, and maybe some deltas for things that you know you need to change off of the base installation of your operating system. You can bake them in as kind of like you're just an OS. You have your container images for supporting applications. So these are the things that like, the first time you use, like before using containers, you would use configuration management, a shell script, whatever you want to use, and you would install this thing once and then like never touch it again because it's just running and you're shoving data into it or you're serving your application from it. And then you have configuration management to maintain the overall state. Right? So it maintains 
application deployment. It maintains modifications to these container images. It maintains any configuration directive or base OS. Right? So this seems like a lot of work. Right? Like, holy cow, I have to learn three different tools. Right? Like I've got to, I've got to learn how to manage my images. Now I have to learn configuration management tools. Now I need to learn containers and how to containerize things. But if you actually break it down, you can use just three tools. And hopefully, even if I'm going to talk about Chef because I work for Chef and I like Chef, I'm not going to talk about Puppet or Ansible or Solve, sorry. Um, uh, you know, if you use tools that kind of help automate a lot of the, the difficulties in each of these layers, um, it kind of makes, it kind of mitigates some of these things. Um, so in this, I'm going to kind of walk through a demo here of what exactly it is that I'm talking But before I do, I've been talking pretty fast. Do you guys have any questions, right? Or is it kind of scary? No? When did uh, the idea of containers, you said it's not really a new idea. When did that first come about? So there was this really good talk at LASA in New Jersey like this spring, and this dude stood up right before me, and it was awesome. And he was like, here's the history of containers. I think it's like sometime in the 70s, like way long time ago. The containers are not new technology, right? Um, there have been attempts at using containers. Um, I think previous these uh, jails were the first attempt. So larger zones came in and tried to do it, right? And so they gained some popularity and then they falter, right? I think the reason Docker is kind of catching a lot of fire is because it's not just a container, right? Docker is just a service that wraps containers and essentially makes them more portable containers, uh -huh, portable packages, a la big, right? Like big is awesome because you package up a VM Show with Docker, same same thing, right? I can just package up a container and give it to you, and it works. And that's never been easily done before. Um, there's other ones like LXC and Let Me Container That For You, which Google has now deprecated in favor of working on the Docker project. So that's cool. Um, but yeah, it's been around for a long time. What else? Anything else? All right. So have I lost anybody? Is everybody still tracking, kind of understanding what it is I'm trying to talk about? All right. So let's talk about Packer first, right? We need to build that solid foundation of a VM. Um, uh, Packer is a tool um, that kind of helps you win that battle about keeping your VM in as up to date. It's written by um, a bunch of people, but the company now is HashiCorp. Um, that's founded by Mitchell Hashimoto, who's also the dude who wrote Vagrant, right? Like, so they wrote Vagrant, Packer. Um, it's really cool because you have this JSON data structure that basically says, this is how it builds a VM, right? This example is for Amazon, right? So the demo that I have is I'm spinning up a VM on Amazon, I'm running some configuration on it, right? I'm actually running some chef cookbooks here to say, make sure Docker gets installed, make sure my application is just sitting on top of my Docker service, right? Um, I can put in things like, you know, my source AMI, all kinds of things. The, the base packer will take, like, it'll build virtual box images, it'll build VMware images, it's pretty awesome. Right? If you haven't heard of it and haven't used it, totally recommend everybody go to look at it, right? Um, uh, because it cuts down on this bullet point here, right? Like, the time you spent refreshing a VM is time that you could be spent doing cooler things than refreshing it. So um, you, you have your base OS, you put your delta on it, and you need to make those changes. You use delta uh, packer to kind of hook it up to a CI system, just spit those out, right? Add new chain, I'll just have my system go auto build it. And now I have this AMI built, right? So this one specifically is going to build an AMI on my AWS that is pre configured and ready to spin up. So, what is Docker? I asked earlier if you've heard of Docker, how many people are using Docker? I usually get about the same ratio, right? It's usually about less than half a dozen people that are using Docker. Um, double that, I have heard of it. So um, I kind of alluded to this and mentioned it earlier. Um, Docker is not a container. Docker combines containers with a uh, with AUFS by default for the file layering system. There are other ways to manage the, the, the file system within the container, but this is the default system that it uses, and it creates those portable, lightweight application containers. Um, they're running 
instances of Docker images. So you build a Docker image, and then a Docker container is the running a image that is running, right? Um, you can share them. There's a public registry. You can have your own private registry internally when your data center or your wherever. Um, and they can actually be single application processors. And here, this next part of the sentence is where like people who like are really like Docker and they're all in on Docker totally argue with me. Is they can be lightly virtual machines that a supervisor is provided. This is like so. I went to DockerCon this year, and this was like it was like the holy war of like the conference. Like there were people literally like arguing very loudly in the hallway about this, right? <laughs> so to take a step back, containers originally are supposed to be isolated black boxes that you cannot get into. They provide a service. They have only one in and out point, and they have one process that can run, right? There's no PID1 that's running inside the container that can manage a bunch of services, there's no supervisor, none of that stuff, right? That's the design decision of what containers are supposed to and so, so that's kind of like the ethos of which Docker was built, right? Like, I've very much been that. There's a lot of restrictions on the APIs, specifically hampering you from doing things like SSHing into a container to see what's going on, right? You basically like fired up an Nginx uh, Docker container, it ran, if it started misbehaving, you terminated it and just up a new one, hope that that would work better, right? So um, there was a lot of lack of visibility. And over time, they added a bunch of stuff, right? Linking has come in, where you can network containers together. Um, they've added log introspection, so you can actually see the standard out of whatever the process is. And some of that has kind of come up as, well, as things have gone on. But there is a growing contingent of people who want to use Docker containers as super lightweight virtual machines. Now, if you remember back to when I said, like, you know, how many people are using AWS and how many other people's AWS bills, bills are really high and how many people would want to like use more of their resources that they're paying for. So that crowd is really hyper about that. Right? Because what they want to do is they want to use the VMs that they provision for Amazon or Rackspace or whatever in the same model that Amazon uses its physical hardware to provide VMs to you as a customer. Right? So there's a really great talk. If you haven't gone, if you haven't seen it, from DockerCon, it's on YouTube. Guys from Shippable, right? They talked about how to game AWS. I think they also talked about it at BlueCon, somewhere else recently. Um, it's an awesome talk, right? These guys are like, hey, so AWS has this like giant server farm, and they put my VMs in blocks, and they maximize the resource utilization of the bare metal, and that's how they make money, right? And so I have this VM, and I have all these wasted resources. So instead of paying for like 15 medium servers, Let's pay for three C3 extra large servers, cram them with containers up to the 90% up to the utilization, and my bill for Amazon is cut to like 30%. Right? So that is such a compelling argument that this crowd is growing pretty rapidly. Right? The same goes with your internal data center, too. Right? Like you have your own hypervisor, you have a data center, you have your own virtualization platform, you have plenty of resource waste. Right? You can't. You can't accurately size your range all the time. Right? So, um, so yeah, that's kind of where this is at, and why it was such a heated conversation. And so, what is Chef? Who here has actually heard Chef before? Yes. <laughs> yes. How many people use Chef? Yes. Awesome. Everybody else is okay. You <laughs> no, it's cool. Does everybody here use an automated configuration tool of any kind? Right? Who is it? Yeah, so everybody is using some kind of tool. If you're not, just use one, right? It's like, that's cool if you don't want it to be chef. Just use something that's not just a bunch of batch tricks. Um, yeah. um, so chef, automation platform, infrastructure as code. The configuration of the systems are performed uh, by reusable recipes. Um, information about the different infrastructure components can be searchable, right? So I can know about it. Like one server over here, and know that the configuration details about another server, and use that to inform uh, the configuration, right? Like, so my web server can go search and find out where the backend database is, and connection details, and just put that in on the fly, right? My configuration. Um, you can run on demand or as a managed service to keep your infrastructure converted. So, that part is where we're going to kind of pull all this stuff in. It can run in on demand or as a managed service. So I want to talk a little bit about Chef Container. So this was released, 
about a month ago, a month and a half ago. Um, so what this is, is it's a, um, a version of Chef Client that includes um, all of the support components to run the Chef Client within a Linux container. Right now, it's primarily supporting Docker, right? Um, there are plans, and it's abstracted in a way so that it doesn't have to be Docker, although Docker's already abstracting the container layer underneath it, so that's cool. We'll just write it on top of that, right? Um, it's packaged with Chef Client. It also comes with Run It. Uh, anybody's heard of that? It's a process supervisor. Um, we're very many. We chose Run It. Um, and uh, a program called Chef Init. Chef Init. <coughs> so essentially what it does is it allows you to bootstrap the container without an SSH connection. Um, ultimately what this does is it get, if the entry point into the container is running Chef Client, right? So you don't run the service that you're trying to run in the container. You run Chef Client. That's what you do. Right? It's the only thing you do in these containers. The Chef Client resources um, are able to be used in the exact same way you already use them on your VMs. Um, uh, it's in a Unix or Linux based platform, if you remember, no Windows. Um, and they can manage multiple services. Right? This is why we package run it into it. So if you remember back in the, the base configuration of Docker, there is no process supervisor out of the box. There have been a lot of base, uh, base kit Docker images that have come out through the wow. There have been lots of blog posts that people have kind of consolidated on some, uh, where they're just like, hey, here's an image that has like CentOS and the supervisor, and you can run it over however many services you want. We kind of package all that stuff up and then add it to the client. So, how do you build these things, right? So essentially, if you go on the Docker registry, there is a chef. Ubuntu 14.04 image, right? You would download or something, and, and you download it, and, and it would have all the stuff prepackaged in it. Um, but then you, how do you actually get your chef code into this container? Right? You give your base image that has the chef in it, the chef, uh, the run it, and the chef client kind of on there. So how would you actually use this thing, right? I, I, have, I have an image, it's a black box, and I have all of my chef code out here. So you use an I container plugin, Essentially, it will initialize and build the Docker container contexts. And what do I mean by that is it grabs any environment files you might have, any cookbooks you might have, you're able to set a run list just like you would on any other chef node, um, and maybe some configuration, right? If you want to connect it to a uh, chef server or you want to, run it, want to run it in mobile mode, right? Um, it has merge shelf integration, so uh, this is actually pretty neat because you can just say, hey, I want Nginx, I want to use the Nginx cookbook, which has a dependency on three other cookbooks, and the Burr shelf integration will just suck up the dependency for you, right? So you don't have to worry about how do we get all those files in there. Um, it currently supports Chef Zero, uh, which is also in local mode, um, similar to, it's like an evolved Chef Solo for any of you who have been using Chef for a while. Um, and then Chef Client mode, which is the coolest part of it. Um, because let's start building. So again, we want to start with a solid foundation. Right? We need a good solid base, which is going to be our VM image. We'll identify the core components that are unlikely to change, and these are the, some of the deltas that I'm talking about in, term, in terms of building a minimal OS. Right? You have your security policies <coughs> and applications. Right? You have tripwire running on your network. Go ahead and get the tripwire app binary installed on the OS, right? If you have you know, Splunk collectors, get that stuff running on the OS, right? You don't have to configure them, but you get the actual binaries on the VM. So you don't have to go download them remotely and like, install them and then add a configuration on top. Um, any image hardening and stuff that you need to do. Um, all the Docker tooling, that's pretty critical, right? So if the Docker tooling is not on your base image, you can't run any Docker containers. So that's kind of critical. Um, and the goal again is to create a minimal base VM combined with components that are consistently configured. Right? You want to uh, keep an eye out for things that, yes, they are different from the base OS, but they don't change every month. Right? They change like once a year, once a quarter, something like that. So here's a quick demo of building the VM. So this is running Packer. So it kind of looks like this. And I just sped this up, by the way. So we're not like sitting here waiting for Amazon to buy. It goes out, creates a temporary key pair, gives me an instance, doing an app update here. Um, 
uh, it'll go through an update here, then it'll go through an update and add all the building components and install the Docker server API, shut down the VM, and then actually package up the AMI and store on your account. Okay? And this is all automated. And so that it was pretty quick up at the top, but there was one line. It was, I have a JSON file, which is my Packer config, Packer build, done. Yeah, question. Yeah, uh, so when you say VM, um, in this case, you're talking about building AMIs. Sure. Right. Okay. Yeah, that was like a question I was holding off. was like, are you running some sort of VM on, say, EC2? But you're talking about making the AMIs be that. So the VM, so the AMI runs the VM, right? Like the AMI is the image, and the VM is the instance of that image, right, for the machine. Right. And so, yeah, so the next step is when I actually spit it up. And I actually have to work, right? So you don't have to like an even lower level OS below your VM. You might have another EC2 instance. Yeah, that's it, right? Like the base, if the, the configuration for this file, I think I might still have it on my laptop. Um, the base, you have to specify a base AMI to start building an AMI, and I just use the default Ubuntu cloud image that they have out there. Um, so you see it's going through, it's running this chef run, going through and installing. Docker getting everything run. Um, it's doing a provisioner, which is actually going to download the images, right, that I need to base, like to create the base layers of the images from the Docker containers. Um, and this is all geared towards preloading as much stuff that I know is not going to change. Right? This goes back to the speediness, right? If I did this from scratch every single time, like I wanted to spin up a new instance, I would A, I'd never be able to auto-scale anything ever because like I would try to spin up the box and it would take me 10 minutes before it was available, which if you're auto scaling is way too long, right? Um, uh, it goes through, finishes, waits for the instance to stop, base the NMI, should be done here in a second. Um, but so this whole process was essentially creating a, uh, an AMI image with which to provision the next one, right? And it goes through and cleans everything up. So this is Packer, right? It's the Oppo from Packer. So you saw the JSON file before. I had that, installed Packer, put my AWS credentials in, boom, I had an AMI, US plus two, here's my AMI, I have Docker, right? It's got Docker installed on it, um, it's got um, uh, all of the whatever security patches I need yeah. to install the system. Um, all that stuff is done, and now I have an AMI. Uh, if I did this by hand, I would spin up an instance, I would have gone through and bootstrapped it and maybe run some shell clients, shove solo against it, um, shut it down, click the little button to say you're getting an AMI, right? So this tool just helps you kind of automate that. So the next thing you need to do is build a Docker factory. Right? So we need a repeatable factory for building Docker container images um, for all of our supporting applications. Uh, the Chef container lets us use our existing Chef cookbooks to create those. Right? So we can essentially drive Chef container to build out Docker images for use on our app. Um, the key to success here when you're building your container images is to create the smallest thing that will work. At its core, it's designed for one process. Right? You can use it as a lightning medium, which is kind of what we're doing with Chef Container. Um, but that doesn't mean you put your entire application stack in a container and run it and call it good. Right? Like, you still want to componentize your infrastructure out into containers as the smallest thing you can and, and interlink those down the road. Right? Have the network, uh, the network links between the containers. You still want to leverage those capabilities. Um, you can actually hook up your continuous integration system and crank these out. So you can easily use the my container plugin to say, I've made a change to a Chef cookbook. I pick up the change in my source control. I go out. I run um, my container to build up a new Docker image based off of the new cookbook changes, spit out a new Docker image, and upload that delta up to my registry. So the next time I try to spin up that specific image, I'm going to get the chain. Right? So let's kind of see how that works. So there's one line, right, basically saying init. Here's what I'm saying. I'm going to do a demo of Nginx. And it went faster than I could talk. But it spits out a bunch of text in different colors, so that's exciting. Right? <laughs> um, and then we build the, the Docker image. And what this is doing is actually runs through. You see the steps for people who have used Docker before, right? It tells you the steps. And then people who have used Chef before, this will look really familiar. Because it's literally spinning up a base image container 
running Chef Client on top and running through and actually doing a Chef Client run inside the container. And in this case, we actually spun it up with a Chef Client configuration, meaning that when this is done and this image is pushed, this is what I did here, right? I'm pushing that to a repository. And so it's saying, hey, this image has already been pushed. Here are the hashes, right? So these are all the base image that I started from, delta changes on the NFS. Uh, eventually, we get to the new one. But what's really cool is that when I actually have this image and I spin up this container now, my on boot or my entry point into the container is Chef Client, which means when I spin up this Chef Client, it will actually register with my Chef server as a node. So the host name will be whatever the container ID is, but you now have something that you can actually manage, a running container that is connected to the <coughs> Chef server, that's checking in whatever your frequency is that's running on the service, right? Um, and I can push changes to my Chef server, pull those down, and update the container on the fly without having to build the image. So here's the image <coughs> successfully was pushed, et cetera, et cetera. Push in the tag, and done. Yeah, should be done. Yeah, done. Yay. So, um, so it builds out, pushes it out. I'm just using the Docker registry, right? Um, but you could actually push this out to your own as well. So now we've got something that's building our VMs automatically using Packer, our VM images. We have something that's building our Docker container images automatically using Chef, uh, Chef Container. So now we need to bring it all together. So we'll have Chef provision the servers that use the base VM, and then they'll also build and run the Docker container on that VM once it's running from the AMI that we just built. The ongoing convergence of the overall desired state is kept um, managed by Chef clients that are running on the, the actual EC2 VM. So we're going to put all this stuff together. So really long, totally to put all this stuff in a config file, but you know. Right. So essentially, we run out knife EC2 server create. So this is a knife EC2 plugin for AWS. It goes out and says, "Hey, I'm gonna spin up this instance ID. Here's my size. Here's the AMI that I just built earlier with Packer. It uses my base image for this VM. It's gonna spin up. It's gonna go to secure your. It's gonna go to <coughs> DNS. Again, this is for anybody who's ever spun anything up on Amazon. This is totally sped up process. Like this is not." I did not win the Amazon lottery. Right? <laughs> so you see it runs in, it runs Chef Client, just like you normally would bring up an Amazon volume, uh, Amazon instance that you're managing with Chef. Uh, it goes through Advocate updates. And so what's happening is all this stuff is nothing, right? Since we configured our original base image with Chef, we just applied the same recipe on top of it, and it didn't have to do anything. So the time to come up is pretty instantaneous because my recipes are open. Oh, I already did this, I already it in. But if something had changed from when I made that image, Chef would catch it and fix it, right? And so then what ends up happening is it, it comes up, we have the public DNS name running, uh, public IP address, private IP address, right? You have the stuff that says it's done, right? So it is done. So actually, before I wrap up, I'm going to come back over to my laptop. I think I still have it from Midwest.io. If I do that, it may have terminated the instance. Let's share really quick. Why'd you do that? Show us paint. Of course, it's a good show. So I'll just pop and not actually show you the live part of the demo. Sorry, I'm under prepared. Um, but in, for the Midwest talk, what I actually did was I showed a page that had the Midwest.io logo and said, "Hey, Midwest.io." I changed the file, uh, essentially an HTML file, to kind of change the content. I uploaded that to my Chef server. I restarted the Docker container, <coughs> picked up the changes, and then showed it live. Right. Um, so sorry, I can't show that. But anyways, so the idea is, is, again, like I said, you make a change. Now that my container is running with the Chef server, I can make a change, push it to the Chef server, restart our Docker container, Chef client runs again, picks up any deltas, updates your changes without having to go and do the process of building a new container image. So wrapping up, yeah? I think the containers clean up from the Chef server. 
<coughs> containers get cleaned up. You mean from a node perspective? Yeah. Yeah, so the same way you clean up any other node. Same band and done here. Yeah. You have a process that does that, right? So um, there is a process when you build, right? So when you build a container, you're using nice container. Um, as the client mode, it has to register with the chef container to or the chef server to pull down the cookbooks. Um, and so it does create a, a node and client on the chef server. When it's done, it does have logic in there to delete those objects, right? So you don't get this never-ending list of nodes that didn't actually ever exist because you can kill them, right? Um, so when you kill the container, you should probably kill the node. Um, so yeah, so again, don't join a call. Right? Hopefully this has kind of shown you that, you know, there are pros and cons to all these tools. And the key takeaway here is, you know, use the tools to the powers that they have, and don't like make yourself go through horrible like downsides of some of these tools just because you want to use the new technology. Um, use what works, makes things faster, more secure, and stable. This is really what we're all trying to do: it's faster, more secure, stable. Keep the base VM small. Use your containers to manage isolated, reusable applications. And then maintain everything with some automated configuration to make sure that there's a new configuration for that. You want to know more? There's a beta release of the Chef container um, on the Chef blog. Uh, it has some information. There's documentation on our site. Uh, there is a video demo that's not this demo that I showed you. There's a different demo out on YouTube on our YouTube channel. You want more information about Packer? It's on uh, www.packer.io. More information about Docker is at docker.com. And that's it. So what questions does everybody have? Yeah. What? Yeah, so I'm gonna give away I'm gonna give away things for people who so, ask questions. Uh, <laughs> I would just say I, I heard you talk about this so ago. Yep. It was awesome. Thank um, you. In fact I'm like I'm waiting for this website because of your talk. I'm waiting for people to post that. Yeah, I can talk to you. That's cool. But I'm going to try one thing. You want to stay here? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah actually, because one thing I didn't get, I feel like you know, maybe you shortened that version of the talk. Mm -hmm. Took the bit and just helped yes. us a little bit you know, more detail. But so the thing I didn't quite get uh, then was, and that, this is kind of what I was asking earlier, like, you have <coughs> chef scripts to build your Docker images, so mm -hmm. that's sort of like the management side sure. of the administration, mm -hmm. and then you have your, to your clients, the actual components of yep. the app and such. Yep. And that's what a different set of chefs are right? No, it's the same thing. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, you, you do have two different contexts mm -hmm. right there. You have the chef cookbooks that actually manage the VM that's running the Docker server API, mm -hmm. and maintaining, like, shepherding the containers themselves, and then you have the chef cookbooks for what the containers are going to be doing. Right. So there are two types. So it's sort of two layers of chef yep. management. Right? Yep. And I guess I don't, maybe that I'm not familiar with the chef server. But sure. It sounds like you're saying that inside of the Docker, mm -hmm. it's running chef client. Yep. The systems for updates. Yep. So that might be minimal changes to something you've previously built. With Correct. The, the lower level chef. Yep. Yeah. So. Um, so yeah, I mean, essentially everything gets centralized in one place, and you kind of reuse the cookbooks, right? So there's not a lot of duplication, but yeah. Yeah, cool. Cool. You want to talk? Yeah. Let's see. <laughs> we have our graphics. Close your cookbook. Learn you some Erlang. We're pretty good. Oh, that one. Dang, I was hoping something, something would happen tonight. Who else? Yeah. So what would you recommend it for uh, ensuring your instances are running? So you would have an instance, mm -hmm. uh, what, do you, what do you use to say, all right, I, I have these 100,000 instances, mm -hmm. I need these all to run, mm -hmm. one of them stops running, mm -hmm. make the right Yeah, so server, so essentially we're talking about server, uh, not really discovery, but kind of like maintaining the existence of yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, or or that one is there. Please, this is my list of servers I want to run. Making sure that these are the ones that stay. Right. Right. Yeah. 
of the server itself, right? Like, so if Chef is running on a, on a, on Chef running on a continual basis, we'll make sure that the service is on the server are running, and then they're not running the data running. So the actual physical server itself, you probably end up using some outside tool. Like, I know, like, Amazon, you would probably just have auto scaling instead of minimum and maximum number of servers that are running. So if it stops running based on the health check, it would spin something back up. Uh, it kind of depends on what you're using to create the VMs. Right? So yeah. we're, we're on data science, so we're, uh, we're, we're looking at it from the perspective of uh, we can do this if we need to, but yeah. there's something out there that already does this really well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, I don't know, does anybody else here have any good suggestions for Nagios? Uh, what's that? I mean, Nagios the monitor, right? Yeah, the monitor is not sure it's running, but we use Nagios. I mean, depending on how you want to bring it up, I'm not going to or you know, you can run a script or something. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, you would probably have to put something together with Nagios to essentially say, uh, yeah. or even like sensor or something else, right? Like to basically say, n number of my servers have reported this down, so I need to kick off some right. process to provision a new machine. Right? Yeah. There's Docker management like, tools out there. Um, yeah, for containers specifically, yeah. yeah. But from the VM perspective, right? There's really not. Let me show the question. Well, yeah, sure. the, the containers are fine. You yes. can ensure that you have a uh, certain amount of VMs right. running in those instances. Yep. Run on VM. Right. Any one of those VMs doesn't care if right. it's supposed to be. Yeah, that's kind of where the Kubernetes stuff, I'm probably saying it wrong, probably, right? Um, that's where the stuff that was just released by Google. Um, it's kind of their take on how they schedule containers, right? That's yeah, kind of well, sure. a couple of different, there's a couple of different tools that are like that. Um, so maybe one of those might be able to. Yeah, watch one of 